Hello there. My name is Justin Klumpner and I'm an art teacher over at Rockwall High School. And today we're going to talk about artwork that ventures into absurdity. Now when I say absurd, I'm not talking about the concepts these artists were exploring. Many of these artists are asking us to re-examine serious ideas. But the way they are making artwork ventures into art making practices that, at the time, were considered absurd. Absurd is defined as wildly unreasonable, illogical, or inappropriate, and all this work was made by artists that moved beyond what their contemporaries understood art making to be, and expanded our understanding of how art could be made. So without further ado, let's discuss the art of the absurd. Alright, if we're going to talk about the art of the absurd, Dadaism is the best place to start. Dada was an anti-art movement, started by this handsome quartet right here. It was a response to World War I, and a reaction to what many of these artists saw as nothing more than an insane spectacle of collective homicide. Its purpose was to ridicule what its participants considered to be the meaninglessness of the modern world. Led by André Breton, the Dadaists created art intended to offend. And they were successful. One art critic said at the time that the Dadaist philosophy was the sickest and most paralyzing and most destructive thing that had ever originated from the brain of man. Are you ready to see some of that Dadaist art? Okay, so Harley seems to be the sickest, most paralyzing, and most destructive thing that has ever originated from the brain of man. But compare this to the art people were used to. And this was revolutionary. Dadaists were inventing playful new systems to make art out of everyday materials that anyone could do, like tearing up paper and letting it fall anywhere in this collage. They would also write what they called accidental poetry by picking words at random that had been cut from newspapers. This leads to the most famous of all the Dadaist work, Fountain by Marcel Duchamp. I know what you're thinking, that's a toilet. And yes, you are right. What Duchamp did was take a standard urinal from the factory, sign it with a fictional name, R. Mutt, and submit it to an exhibition that accepted any and all art submitted. And of course, the urinal was rejected. So then, Duchamp wrote a spirited defense of the hard work of the invented character Richard Mutt. Duchamp was asking the question, why is one person's creation considered art and another's considered plumbing? Why don't we value what Duchamp called the struggle towards realization? The series of efforts, pain, satisfactions, refusals, and decisions that Richard Mutt underwent in making this work. See, Duchamp was one of the first people to champion the idea that anything can be art. That's a very common notion now, but back then it was revolutionary. He developed the idea of the ready-made. He did things like writing cheeky phrases on a postcard of the Mona Lisa, or putting a bicycle wheel on a stool and calling it a work of art. This would take a common, everyday object and recontextualize it, making us consider it as a work of art. This forced people to consider the line between art and life in ways they hadn't before, and this has influenced countless artists in the hundreds of years since. Surrealist artists, especially in the 1930s, began arranging objects and combinations that challenged reason and summoned subconscious and poetic associations. The most easily obtained materials were objects cheaply purchased at flea markets. The mundane, mostly mass-produced objects were recontextualized when arranged in unprecedented and provocative configurations. André Breton, the Dadaist turned surrealist, believed that this new form of sculpture, called assemblage, had the power to puncture the thin veneer of reality and tap into the subconscious mind. Another group of artists highly influenced by Dadaism was Fluxus. Fluxus began as a small, international network of artists and composers adopting a do-it-yourself attitude to creative activity, often staging random performances and using whatever materials were at hand to make art. Seeing themselves as an alternative to academic art and music, Fluxus was a democratic form of creativity open to anyone. Artists like George Brecht created performances, or happenings, to challenge what could be considered art. Drip music is Brecht's most famous and most performed piece. In it, he composed a score that is very open to interpretation. Although Brecht performed it himself multiple times, he allowed for anyone to perform it. 
In that sense, the piece is a quintessential expression of Flux's philosophy. There was a belief that money and celebrity was corrupting art. So Flux's artists attempted to make works of art that couldn't be owned. By withdrawing from personal authorship of the work, Breck rejects the cult of the artist. The event score is a great example of that. These were short, sometimes vague, sometimes poetic, sometimes impossible instructions that artists wrote allowing for anyone to make art whenever and wherever they wanted. And it again blurred the line between what was art and what was everyday life. Water Yam is a collection of event scores put out by Brecht in 1963. Now if we read direction, arrange to observe a sign indicating a direction of travel, travel in the indicated direction, travel in another direction. Now that we've read that, does this mean that every time we see a sign that we are caught in a flux is happening? That blurring of everyday life was exactly the point. Another well-known fluxus artist was Yoko Ono. One of her most famous works was the event score cut piece. The score says, performer sits on a stage with a pair of scissors in front of him. It is announced that members of the audience may come on stage one at a time to cut a small piece of the performer's clothing to take with them. Performer remains motionless throughout the piece. Piece ends at the performer's option. Here you can see Ono performing the score, but it has been performed by many others. Ono, as you can see, remained motionless and expressionless throughout until, at her discretion, the performance ended. When asked about her performance, Ono said, it was kind of a criticism against artists who are always giving what they want to give. I wanted people to take whatever they wanted, so it was very important to say you can cut wherever you want. Now some of you might recognize the name Yoko Ono. She has made an indelible mark on music history as the wife and collaborator of John Lennon of the Beatles. They were married one year before the Beatles broke up. Since then there has been much speculation as to whether Ono may have played a role in the group's rupture. They became active in the anti-war movement of the 1970s and went on to collaborate on a series of music projects. Their last album together was Double Fantasy, which came out in 1980, just three weeks before Lennon's assassination. Adrian Piper is another conceptual and performance artist known for her provocative works that explore race, gender, class, and identity. She studied both art and philosophy and blends ideas from both disciplines in her work. She performed confrontational pieces such as The Mythic Being, for which she was filmed walking the streets of New York City in Cambridge, Massachusetts, dressed as a light-skinned African-American male with a mustache and an afro wearing sunglasses. She repeated memorized phrases from her personal journals and challenged passers-by as she went. In her work, My Calling Card, Piper handed out printed notes to people who had accidentally offended her, including one with the line, Dear friend, I am black. I am sure you did not realize this when you made, laughed at, agreed with that racist remark. I wonder, do you have anything you find yourself wanting to say so often that you wish you kept a card of it in your pocket? All right, let's jump to someone a little more contemporary. Like the Fluxus artist, Janine Antoni's work blurs the line between performance art and sculpture. She takes everyday activities such as eating, bathing, and sleeping, and turns them into ways of making art. In her work, Mortar and Pestle, she captures a woman's tongue licking a man's eyeball. His pupil reacts to protect itself. And Tony states, I wanted to know the taste of his vision. Ugh. In Loving Care, Antoni uses her hair as a paintbrush and Loving Care hair dye as her paint. Antoni dipped her hair in a bucket of hair dye and mopped the gallery floor on her hands and knees. And in the process, she pushed the viewers out of the gallery space. With this, Antoni explored the body as well as themes of power, femininity, and the style of abstract expressionism. In Lick and Lather, Antoni produced 14 busts, seven casts from chocolate and the other seven from soap. She then alters the busts by eating the chocolate ones and bathing herself with the soap ones. The installation critiques the notions of feminine beauty and hygiene. Trenton Doyle Hancock is from nearby Denton. 
Through paintings, comics, and sculptures, and gathered objects like board games and collectible toys, Hancock has built an immersive world to house a personal mythology that he has been developing. His Mind of the Mound installation is a wonderful world full of his own creations, with myths and conflicts both colorful and fun, but with serious undertones, presented like an exhibit in a natural history museum. Some reoccurring figures in Hancock's mythology are his sentient mounds, their natural antagonists, the vegans who love tofu, order, and emptiness and can't see color, Undum Endgal, a protective mother figure who cares for the souls of departed mounds, and Torpedo Boy, Hancock's alter ego who always wears his yellow tights and tidy whities and who strives with mixed results to protect Moundum. This massive installation allows viewers to consider big ideas of memory, self-identity, and the ownership of how identity is built. Banksy is an anonymous England-based street artist, vandal, political activist, and film director active since 1990. He is mostly known for his satirical street art and subversive images that combine dark humor with stencil-style graffiti. His work is often created illegally on buildings, but has become so valuable that parts of buildings have been removed so the work can be sold. In 2018, in response to the auctioning of his work, Banksy designed a prank that received wide news coverage around the world, with one newspaper stating that it was quite possibly the biggest prank in art history. One of Banksy's Balloon Girl paintings was sold in an auction at Sotheby's in London for $1.4 million. However, right after it was sold, an alarm sounded inside of the picture frame and the canvas passed through a shredder that had been hidden within the frame, partially shredding the picture. Banksy then went and posted an image of the shredding on Instagram, captioning, going, going, gone. Maurizio Catalan is an Italian artist known primarily for his hyper-realistic sculptures and installations. His satirical approach to art has resulted in him being frequently labeled as a joker or prankster of the art world. His works are mostly satirical and ironic and always full of humorous twists. Catalan's work titled America is an 18 karat fully functioning solid gold toilet. This sculpture playfully expressed how connected everyone is regardless of their wealth. In modern times, the overly rich and the poor ultimately all use the bathroom. The golden toilet was for the Guggenheim Museum in New York, but later found its way to Blenheim Palace in the United Kingdom, where it was reported stolen in 2016 because gold is super valuable. Another work you might have heard of is Comedian. The work consists of a fresh banana taped to a wall with a piece of duct tape, which sold for $120,000 in 2019. It was one of the most talked about works of the year, with some people calling it a genius critique of the ridiculous prices the rich pay for art, while others wondered if it was even art at all. All right, so all the work I've just showed you really challenges what the nature of art is and what can be considered art. What do you think? Did you like it? Does it change what you think art is or what you think art can be? Does this mean that we are all artists whether we like it or not? Head over to Canvas and let me know if you have any questions and check out today's module for your next task. Take care.